Jane Wells Books in La Jolla, California. And tonight, we are honored to host Nobel Laureate Dr. James D. Watson, who will discuss his new book, Avoid Boring People, Lessons from a Life in Science. Dr. V.S. Ramachandran has graciously agreed to introduce Dr. Watson. V.S. Ramachandran is director of the Center for Brain and Cognition at UCSD and adjunct professor of biology at the Salk Institute. Dr. Ramachandran was a Rouse Ball scholar at Trinity College, Cambridge, and received a fellowship from All Souls College, Oxford. He is also a fellow of the Neurosciences Institute in La Jolla and a fellow of the London, of the, uh, of the Royal Institute of London and winner of the Henry Dale Prize. He was invited by the BBC to give the Wreath Lectures for 2003. His books include Phantoms in the Brain and A Brief Tour of Human Consciousness. Dr. Ramachandra. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I am delighted and honored to be here and honored to introduce Jim Watson, whom everybody knows, but when uh, Dennis asked me to say a few words, I agreed, because as all of you know, this is a, a little cultural oasis in the midst of this cultural desolation of San Diego. <laughs> I think it's delightful that we're doing here, and we thank Jim for coming and uh, signing a few books. Now, I'll try to be brief. Um, everybody knows about the discovery of the double helix, which uh, was accomplished by Jim Watson and uh, Francis Crick, who was here at the Salk. Um, and Peter Medawar once said it all when he said the discovery of the double helix in the genetic code was the single most important discovery in biology in the last hundred years. And I think most people here would agree with that. Now, what impressed me most, and many of my colleagues, can people hear me or yeah. way at the back, was the fact that uh, the, the fact that it was so elegantly simple. I mean, you can explain this discovery to a 14-year-old, even a 12-year-old schoolboy, and they would understand its significance. And the, the ticker toy approach, here are the two scientists in this age of high-tech science and large teams of scientists of hundreds or dozens and dozens of scientists, it's refreshing to read about this discovery where there are these two people who actually didn't even know the formulae of the actual, um, the, the uh, adenine and thymine and all of those molecules, but went and you know, took a bits and pieces of plastic and wire and essentially solved the greatest riddle in all of biology, uh, the genetic code. And it, it, one has to be careful not to over-romanticize science, but I think here is a genuine case where it was a tremendous flash of insight and again, what's impressive is I often tell my students the importance of analogical thinking in science. Because when the double helix was solved, the complementarity of the helix was important. Because every schoolboy asks, every child asks his mother or father, why do goats not give birth to pigs? I mean, how come it gives birth only to goats? Now, sounds like a silly question, but that's often, you know, the kind of question that a child asks is what's difficult to answer. And I think what Jim and I, and you can correct me if I'm overstating this, but what Jim and Francis saw was that the complementarity of the double helix, the molecule, dictates the complementarity of offspring and parent. And this was a radical new insight, and you could say at that moment, modern biology was born. And we could go on and on, but I won't. Um, <laughs> uh, now, brief, uh, brief remark about his book, The Double Helix which is tremendously influential in getting a lot of people excited about science. Uh, several generations of students, including me, when I first read this book, I remember saying to myself, um, you know, here are these two people having fun. I didn't realize science could be like being Sherlock Holmes. I thought it was all about big machines and high tech and all of that. Here are two people having a great deal of fun being like Sherlock Holmes, and you can make the most amazing discovery in biology in the last hundred years. Now, his new book is about boars. I haven't read it yet, but I'm reminded of Huxley's remark that boars are the worst enemy of civilization. And, and the worst kind of boar is the academic boar who inhabits university campuses, and I can vouch for that. Okay. Um, also reminded of another remark, which is equally appropriate, I think. The man who lets himself be bored is even more contemptible than the boar himself. And this is by Samuel Butler. Okay. Um, now, more recently, Jim has been known for some of his provocative, tongue-in-cheek, irreverent, sometimes even rude remarks. But we have to bear in mind 
that you can't please everybody. Some people get very annoyed by these remarks, but as Lord Reed, director of BBC, once said, there are some people whom it is one's duty to annoy. <laughs> and I hope we see a few examples of this today. The, the original uh, title by which uh, I wrote most of the manuscript was uh, Manners for Science. It is more or less uh, you know, how you should behave when you're doing science. And, uh, or, and going back even before you do science. Um, uh, I realized that would not get me on the Jay Leno show, so I, uh, <laughs> you know, say for one, just science would kill it, and uh, so I uh, bemoaned to uh, uh, several people at Cold Spring Harbor, and uh, later that day they came up triumphantly and with the cover of. Uh, the book and they said avoid boring people uh, which was one of my rules in uh, or ways to uh, succeed and uh, initially you know i didn't see the double meaning and the moment i saw the double meaning then i realized it's a good title uh, and uh, but we weren't convinced that people would see the double reading and uh, that's why the cover uh, I told them to put other tiny, tiny, so you could hardly see it, but they uh, made it two shades of white, and uh, when you first see the book, you don't see uh, avoid uh, boring other people, mm -hmm. uh, which is really the message to academics. <laughs> uh, you know, the, you've got this captive audience of students often who have to take your course and, uh, uh, you know, if you believe in your subject and if you really believe in a university, you've got to uh, uh, make your subject interesting uh, to students and uh, I tried to do that when I uh, I uh, gave 10 lectures at Harvard in uh, it was first 1959. Uh, it was, uh, uh, the biology course was universally regarded as a failure and a bore. And so they thought they, they would be just half as boring, we'll only have it for a half year. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> then we'll have four different lectures, of which uh, I, I think I was the only one who wasn't boring. So they continued in the tradition of making biology pretty turgid, and uh, but uh, uh, I was originally going to call the book uh, "This Is Life," <laughs> uh, take off on what is life, the book that, uh, and uh, but then uh, you know I realized that was a pretentious title, and it ended up uh, as a molecular biology gene which uh, has served it uh, uh, well. Uh, it was going to be a 100-page book. It uh, you know, ended up 400. It took uh, just a little over a year to, to write. And uh, uh, when I was writing it, uh, I gave up writing The Double Helix and concentrated on that. And then when I was finished and came out uh, effectively by early summer 1965, it was uh, finished. And that's when I got to work on the double helix. And uh, I finished that in uh, early uh, 1966. And then it took two years to get published. Uh, and uh, one of the chapters in Avoid Boring People was, uh, you know, how I became a writer. And, uh, you know, what Francis Crick's reaction was when he saw the manuscript. And uh, finally, you know, what my lawyer's reaction was to the letter Francis's lawyer wrote to the president of Harvard. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, but from the start, he said my book didn't libel Francis. It was very complimentary to him. So he had no basis. And, uh, uh, the, the lawyer that Athenaeum got, it was a firm I had no respect for. It was originally going to be published by Harvard University Press, and a very good editor. Uh, and then uh, Nathan Pusey told them not to because he didn't want to uh, be part of a, a feud between scientists. And uh, 
so I, I didn't mind that too much because uh, uh, Tom Wilson then, uh, they have a job, he, he was soon having to retire, uh, moved to Athenaeum, and so I kept the book with the original uh, uh, publisher who uh, I greatly respected. And uh, I think the Double Helix finally, you know, got published because Sir Lawrence Bragg wrote a forward. <laughs> and uh, even after Crick and Wilkins objected, he kept his preface. In. And uh, uh, I think uh, he uh, saw that, it was, you know, that Harvard Press, and particularly Tom Wilson, wasn't... Uh, <laughs> You know, was a man of great integrity and wasn't going to publish junk and uh, wasn't out for notoriety, but was thought uh, the Double Helix was a good book. And uh, uh, I, uh, I was enthusiastic about the book ever uh, from the moment I got the first sentence. I've never seen Francis in a modest mood. Uh, that was changed to uh, I have never seen Francis Crick in a modest mood. They wanted me to make it easier. And uh, the rather stupid lawyer from uh, Anthony wanted me to change. You know, I've seldom seen Francis Crick in a but you know, you realize that I wasn't going to change the, the opening. Um, so I was conscious, you know, that uh, you needed a good uh, opening sentence. And uh, so in this book, uh, once I had the opening sentence, I uh, knew where to go. Uh, the opening sentence is, I, I was born in Chicago in 1928 into a family which believed in books, birds, and the Democratic Party. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that sort of summarized my background. Uh, so you, <laughs> you know what we thought of Republicans, and uh, <laughs> that uh, my father inhabited secondhand bookstores, <laughs> and uh, my mother was a uh, precinct captain for the Democratic Party, and we had the elections in the basement of our tiny bungalow. So, uh, uh, so uh, I tried to, you know, let the uh, the reader sort of know where I came from and uh, you know, tried to let them know sort of what my father was like and uh, my father you know we lived in a dreary neighborhood in the sense there were really no people who read books around us but uh, where we could afford and uh, uh, my father uh, sort of uh, when he wasn't having to go to his job basically as a bill collector, uh, uh, he didn't mind being on the streetcar for 45 minutes each way because he could read books. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then would take me to the public libraries when I, you know, I got old enough so we could, you know, I could walk the same pace as he did. So. Uh, between 13 and 15 every Friday night, except when it was too hot or too cold. Uh, I would go to the library and come back with three or four books, which I would read during the course of the week. And uh, so, uh, you know, books were my most important friends. Uh, they were the, the people that uh, sort of stimulated me. And uh, Though my neighborhood wasn't bad, the little kid who lived next to me, Tony Cromwell, and he, he became the uh, chief tuba player of the Chicago Symphony. So he was not the world's most you know, glamorous instrument, but he was the Chicago Symphony. <laughs> you know, which, uh, and uh, uh, the other thing which was good about Chicago is Chicago never looked up to New York or Boston. It, it looked up to London or Paris or Florence or Rome, but it never thought there was anything in New York or Boston to copy. <laughs> so, uh, 
which put me in good state when I became a member of the Harvard faculty, you know, that I uh, <laughs> never, you know, by, <laughs> and I realized, you know, afterwards I got a, a much better education in Chicago than I would have ever got at Harvard. Uh, uh, Robert Hutchins wrote he wanted to prepare his students for greatness. You read the great books, so you uh, had role models for what you should try and do later in your life. So uh, Chicago uh, wanted people who thought. And uh, so I was very pleased. Uh, and then, by, but you know, when I got out of there, you know, it was sort of skin of my teeth, you know. I never expected to be 5'8 or anything like that, because uh, I never thought I was that bright. Uh, but by choosing easy courses, uh, you know, I ended up there. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a seemingly good record. And that was the reason for one of my rules. Take courses where you get good grades. <laughs> you might as well, you know, if you find something you get A's, maybe you can stick with it. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, a few years ago, the University of Chicago was listed in one of these lists of U.S. news and report uh, as the third most unpleasant place to get an education. In the country. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting to know who bracketed Chicago. Number five was Johns Hopkins, which apparently is just no fun to go to at all. <laughs> and <laughs> number four was Rensselaer Polytechnic in Roy, <laughs> Troy, New York. <laughs> that town has been dead for, you know, <laughs> 100 years. And uh, uh, but number two and number one were the ones that uh, interested me. They were uh, uh, the Military Academy and, Naval, and uh, the Naval Academy. They were the most unpleasant. And then suddenly I realized that Chicago was officer's training school. <laughs> but for intellectuals. <laughs> you know, it was to train you not to, f to fight with your fists, but to fight with your brain. <laughs> and be logical, and if you were logical, uh, you'd win over people who, you know, uh, didn't, you know, <laughs> believe in logic. <laughs> you know? And uh, so uh, when I got to Indiana, uh, which I went to because Caltech rejected me, uh, Turned out Indiana was very, very good, probably better than, except for the absence of Linus Pauling, it was a more exciting place than Caltech. And uh, uh, then uh, there was Herman Mower, who was perhaps the most important biologist in the world in the first half of the century. I mean, uh, he, he really <laughs> was the one who really saw what the gene had to do and was just very, very bright. And uh, so my first term, I took his course, which was sort of his uh, his life <laughs> and his frustrations and, uh, you know, his fleeing Texas to go to Berlin and then fleeing Berlin when Hitler came into power and going to Russia and uh, uh, finding that Stalin didn't like him and fleeing Russia and uh, ending up in Edinburgh just before the war started. And then no one in the United States wanted him. <laughs> and uh, a friend at Amherst gave him a job so he could come back. And then Indiana University made him a professor in 1946. And he got the Nobel Prize uh, soon after he arrived on the Indiana campus. And uh, so, uh, and then uh, my supervisor, Gloria and uh, Renato Vebeco, who's long been here at the SOC, uh, there were the three of us in this <laughs> lab in Indiana. So my education was very high quality from uh, the moment I got to uh, high school. So uh, my success is certainly due to, uh, you know, nurture. But uh, uh, I think Francis, you know, the uniqueness of Francis and I wasn't nurture. You just had to see Francis's mother, you know. 
No, she was a nice woman, but you just would see no connection whatsoever. And uh, so uh, I, I think in both cases, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're products of, uh, uh, you know, uh, genes, uh, you know, on the British Isles and our own. So, uh, you know, I don't, uh, my love of words, you know, I could describe to my quarter Irish heritage. I don't you know if that means anything. Uh, and uh, so, uh, one of the uh, first rule in my chapter on, uh, you know, uh, writing is to be the first to tell a good story. Uh, so, you know, I, best for me to tell how the double helix was found and uh, no one had written a, a textbook about DNA, so I was the first. And uh, now, uh, you know, I gave my archives to Cold Spring Harbor and I didn't want anyone else to use them before I did, so I wanted to tell my own story. Uh, there's one book out just dreadfully dull about me. I mean, it's just awful. And, uh, uh, you know, by someone I like, but I mean, of course I didn't let him read anything uh, of my private things. <laughs> so I didn't want to make his book good. <laughs> it's a bit boring. Uh, but, uh, so almost every name in the book that's mentioned, with a few exceptions, which are indicated as otherwise, uh, didn't bore me. <laughs> so that was a <laughs> uh, uh, quality. Uh, the other is, uh, I think my mother was, uh, she was very successful with people. Everyone liked her. And she was very loyal, so I tried to, in a sense, be loyal to the people who've been uh, uh, with me. And, uh, you know, except for, you know, a few people who, uh, you know, I, I totally dislike. Uh, yeah, I, you know, even enjoy talking to Catholic priests, so, you know, I... <laughs> <laughs> you know, my mother was an Irish Catholic, so, you know, I was raised as, but uh, my father used to hate the Pope. He didn't hate the Catholic Church, it was just the Pope, and that was because my father hated Father Coughlin, <laughs> who hated Roosevelt Jews and Democrats. So, you know, it was very uh, simple, and so I've never felt any... Uh, uh, guilt about feeling hatred toward people. Uh, some people <laughs> should be hated. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, you know, for the most part, you should just avoid hateful people. And, uh, but uh, I do, I was taught that hypocrisy and search of social acceptance erodes your self respect. Uh, it's very important. Just don't go along with, uh, fit into a group, you know. <laughs> You know, uh, my father's really favorite people were the intellectual Jews who were on the radio, Clifton Fadiman, all the uh, information, please. That, that was from my father. I, you know, my father really liked Jews because they didn't believe in God. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, if you think about it. <laughs> so, you know, it was a, you know, a slightly unrealistic environment, but, you know, it did, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, my parents were both good people, I think that's all I could say, and, uh, they never had a trace of uh, this, this like pleasure I get from being wicked against people that deserve it. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, and uh, though I'm, you know, prone to making more outrageous remarks than Francis ever did, uh, 
I just felt that someone had to say these things because I never felt something, I said something I didn't think most of my friends didn't agree with. So I never felt I was really ahead of it. It was just that others didn't want to say it. <laughs> uh, you know, but I never believed in consensus. And, uh, you know, trying to find the common ground uh, with idiots. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, you know, too much of academia. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, uh, my main effort is to, you know, give young people to try and also be honest. Uh, particularly in these days of political correctness, uh, where, you know, it's not only the male members of the California legislature are girly men, so are most of the male faculty at Harvard. Oh. <laughs> you know, they're afraid to, you know, <laughs> say what they think. And, you know, as if, uh, you know, the women are right. <laughs> so, uh, I tried to, in the uh, epilogue of uh, the white-born people, to recount uh, a day's visit back to Harvard at the urging of Tom Maniatis. Uh, uh, Larry Summers was out and uh, they were searching for a new president, so they called upon Derek Bach, who had been president 20 years ago. So I went up to talk to him to, to try and to tell him that this big new campus across the Charles was just going to be inhabited by B-plus people. And that Harvard was fallen dreadfully in biology behind MIT. And... Uh, thought that you didn't have to, they didn't have to spend any of their own money they, uh, on science uh, because they didn't really like it. So, you know, it was never to, <laughs> we were always slightly, you know, out of, uh, you know, the company report at Harvard actually thinks economists are intelligent. <laughs> yeah, now you think about it. Uh, you know, they get this phony Nobel Prize, but I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know, it's a, you know, that sort of summarizes the sad state of academia. Uh, and uh, so, you know, and I told them that. Uh, you know, that Harvard would only be thought number one if its salaries were number one, which they aren't anymore. They're just the same, you know. They, they say, oh, they don't want to put pressure on other schools, uh, you know. But uh, we, we get a lot of nonsense now that the uh, American science doesn't get Americans into it because uh, our high schools don't prepare. So unlike the Chinese who take high school seriously, our kids don't. I think that's crap. White kids have long known that uh, science doesn't pay you enough to be uh, <laughs> And Jewish kids only went into science because they were discriminated against. <laughs> Once discrimination is gone, they're gone. <laughs> so, you know, we've not got people from abroad or women. I mean, that's it. <laughs> you know, and the women still, you know, subconsciously know that if they're successful, they'll have someone who can support them. But men never marry a woman for financial support. <laughs> so, you know, you, you just can't go into it. So I, I, I just, you know, told this new president, who uh, wouldn't have been my first choice, yeah. uh, 
nor would Tom check. So I'm just, uh, uh, I told Derek that they should choose an Irishman as next president of Harvard. Uh, you know, two Jews had failed, so just go to the <laughs> Irish. And uh, we both agreed that, you know, Pat Moynihan would have been a wonderful president if he had <laughs> gone to the bottle at lunchtime. <laughs> but, you know, he really he had a deeply intelligent man uh, who was concerned and loved our country. So, you know, that was, uh, uh, we couldn't at that time think of, you know, uh, you know, someone who, but, you know, I, I wanted someone who was cultured. The trouble is most scientists aren't very cultured. <laughs> you know, they haven't you know, ever had a good education. <laughs> like I got at Chicago. So, uh, you know, they really don't, uh, they're not much, you know, they're boring. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even if, you know, being a member of the National Academy is, <laughs> it doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, uh, so I tried to, you know, emphasize the salary structure was just incompatible, and I said they had to give a, the university should give political correctness back to the politicians. <laughs> it, it just it made uh, the whole group uh, hypocrites, you know, so that uh, academia has no respect for other people because it can't believe what it says. <laughs> you know, men aren't women. I don't, you know. <laughs> I don't want them to be. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, you know, uh, we've passed, you know, I think we've given when women and blacks what we never gave them before. They have civil, uh, civil rights. You know, it's up to you to, if, you know, if you want to be a great mathematician, do it. <laughs> and you'll certainly get a job. <laughs> Uh, but uh, up to now, I don't think it's worth arguing. You know, the Summers thing may, I think he was right. If I had been there, I would have been the second faculty member who stood behind him. Even though, you know, he was a dreadful president. He was autistic and insulted everyone. So he couldn't be president. And uh, he had to go. It was a terrible mistake of uh, an economist. <laughs> Ruben. <laughs> You know, who thought Larry would change? People can't change. Have any of you known an unpleasant person suddenly become pleasant? <laughs> no. <laughs> because you're not unpleasant because you want to be, it's just because you don't have your brain stop working right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, there was real ignorance of the Harvard Corporation when they chose Summers. And uh, so I, uh, then when I saw the new president, uh, I said, uh, I'm at Harvard, you know, I, see, I think I'm in a foreign country. I don't see any Americans. <laughs> and uh, told her that Harvard should have a strong program of affirmative action for the Scotch-Irish. <laughs> now, now, if you, uh, Senator Webb, before he became, you know, he's a real bright man. He's Scotch-Irish, wrote a book called Born Fighting, the History of the Scotch-Irish. Ten presidents, most of the leaders of the uh, military academies, <laughs> we're out to win. <laughs> And, you know, but most people regard the Scotch-Irish as poor white trash. <laughs> so they're mad at the Democrats for giving black civil rights with no one caring about them. <laughs> so a strong affirmative action program by the Ivy League toward the Scotch-Irish would bring some of them back to the Democratic Party. <laughs> Otherwise, we're condemned, you know, and to lose their votes. So, and uh, so I think Harvard is, uh, you know, 
you know, they, they want to be global universities of the rich. You know, not just the American rich, <laughs> by being the world's rich. You know, they want the Persian rich, all the rich, come to Harvard. But uh, they basically have forgotten about too many of America's poor. <laughs> I guess you know it's all words, but if you really ask, uh, you know, you don't give a fuck about the Scotch Irish. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, so I, I mean, just you know, I, I think we have to have faith in our country, and not think we have to save it by immigrants. Immigrants have always been important, and uh, boy, I, I want to get them. But you shouldn't just give up on us. So if you want an, an, uh, Americans to go for knowledge, you, my salary is less than a, a major league umpire. <laughs> <laughs> Think of that. So, you know, something is wrong. <laughs> so we just blame the high schools. So if uh, you know the, the new president of Harvard wants to change our country, just pay us what we're worth. Then we won't have to, you know, be consultants to companies who we'll actually see undergraduates. They all say, you, you know, one thing you know if you send your children to Harvard, they won't see any of the famous professors. They're trying to make enough money to live in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, my view back of Harvard, uh, you know, I, it gave me, uh, it was a wonderful place to be. Uh, and uh, so it's, 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 it's not an attack on Harvard, it's just I was at Harvard and if it was at Yale, I'd probably have even less respect for some of its actions. But uh, the one I will never forget is, the year I got my Nobel Prize, they didn't uh, increase my salary. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, was uh, a message. <laughs> and the question is, what message was it? <laughs> you know, incompetence in University Hall, or they wanted me in San Diego? Both, I think. <laughs> but, you know, I wasn't going to leave. So I wrote a textbook and uh, doubled my Harvard income. <laughs> so I never had to think about uh, uh, being underpaid. But uh, I think one reason scientists are hard to be, you know, not boring, is they're too poor. <laughs> yeah. Money, if used correctly, can, you know, let you see London or... Uh, <laughs> you know, see other cultures or, uh, you know, and uh, so relatively speaking, academics are moving downward still. Um, and uh, if it's not reverse course, the next, or this century will be out of China. But, uh, you know, my Anglo-Saxon Celtic heritage would not be happy about that. <laughs> Because we've always been on top, so I just can't imagine not being on top. <laughs> and I think, uh, uh, you know, despite the awfulness of American foreign policy now, we're still a country that's much worth saving. And we should all go out with the thought that uh, we're very lucky still to be in our country and we've just got to take it away from the rich trash and other people who now uh, dominate our, uh, you know, take the government away from the rich trash and try and do something about the poor trash. Okay, thank you. Dr. Watson, we'll take a few questions. I would like to begin, if I may, and ask you to go back to the... Oh, and if the question comes in, perhaps if you could give a pre so the audience can hear it. But my question... I would appreciate if I didn't have to apologize for my bad behavior to Rosalind Franklin so again. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but this, you know, someone wants me to uh, do that again. I'll do it just to stop them. <laughs> Dr. Watson, I had intended to ask you to ask you to go back to the 1950s and to discuss your recollections of another woman, and, and by that I mean Odile Crick in the, oh, in the 1950s. Oh, she was a good cook. No. <laughs> uh, no, that was very important because you know what you could get in Cypriot in Indian restaurants in Cambridge was just awful. <laughs> you know, and that's about all that they you know you wouldn't go into an English. You know, the the good English restaurant you you can't have uh, good English food if you pay for it. <laughs> but <laughs> so Odile, you know, made my life. Uh, she was very kind to me, and uh, you know, uh, took pity on me because uh, you know I always, uh, you know, she kept you know hope that I might you know someday meet a girl or something like that, uh, and. Uh, but uh, as a couple, they fitted each other very well, and uh, uh, yeah, they 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 knew how to avoid boring people. <laughs> Sir, a question from Doctor Dev: How long does it normally take you to before you find out whether someone is a bore or not? <laughs> About ten seconds. <laughs> I mean, you know, pretty fast. I mean, uh, 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 and the second question, like Craig Venter, are you going to publish your genome sometime? Now, my genome has been on the web now since uh, about 20th of June. So uh, there's a Nature paper where they want some revisions, but anyone can look at my genome now. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, you know, Craig has looked at his Alzheimer's, so, you know, uh, after 80, Craig is, you know, not going to be all with us. But, you know, he's got another 20 years to piss people off. <laughs> Dr. Watson, this question from a young gentleman here. The moment you and Craig discovered DNA, how did you guys feel about the credit, or, or at that moment, what did you <laughs> Question. Well, I, I felt, you know, you know well, we felt happy, you know, it was uh, we were on a cloud because, you know, we'd done something, the structure was so much more simpler and more elegant than we ever expected. So, uh, and, uh, you know, I think we felt very lucky, you know, that, you know, Rosalind hadn't really seriously worked on it, and uh, Linus made this, Pauling made this fearful mistake. So we were only in, you know, won the race because the, t the two more qualified runners stumbled. <laughs> so, uh, you know, don't get into races with more than three people. You know, you can't on three, three, you know, people better than yourself falling, you know. But they did. Uh, There's a question from that gentleman in the corner. Um, I'm just curious, so I can apologize in advance for boring you. Uh, I'm just curious um, if you've ever been interested in the problem of consciousness. I mean, uh, no. No. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I, I'm interested in. Uh, and how long it takes us to be conscious, uh, which is, you know, how do I really return a serve when it comes at 130 miles an hour? And occasionally I can do it. And you, you know that uh, uh, you've had to, to make, you swung your arm before you're conscious of it uh, uh, being so, you know, you have to follow a clue and decide where it's going, you know, when it's still before it's just as it's tossed, and then you may get it. So, you know, how many synapses does, does it go through the cortex or does it go from the thalamus to the cerebellum? I don't know where, you know. So, that sense, I'm interested in the how long it takes to be conscious, but not where it's located. 
Uh, my guess is it's not located. I think it's diffuse, but I don't have any reason for believing that. But it just seems to be such a global that, uh, that you know, uh, it's limited by whatever the uh, 40 hertz or whatever it is unifies something over some distance. But I, I you know, I, I'm not. It's too difficult for me, so you know, I'd, I'd rather, you know, be practical, you know, uh, you know, which tells me, you know, to look at the the face of the person serving, not uh, trying to, uh, and then when it kicks, it's you're all lost. I mean, you know. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Watson, there's a question from this gentleman right here outside. Yes. You talk mostly about academia. How about industry? Are there foreign people in industry? Certainly at the top. <laughs> I mean, you know, people who you know think marketing. You know, it's a, you know they shouldn't be running large pharmaceutical companies, but they have, and uh, the only thing that's guaranteed is their high salaries. Dennis, repeat the question. Would you? There's a question from Colonel Carlson. Uh, apart from uh, Pat Moynihan and uh, uh, who, uh, who do you consider the, the foremost Irish intellectual? Doctor, could you repeat the question for the outside? And G.B. Shaw. Apart from Pat Moynihan and G.B. Shaw. Well, I, at the University of Chicago, I had a wonderful teacher, David Green, who was probably the, uh, and you know, he taught me Dostoevsky, and uh, uh, so he had a strong influence on me. You know, he was just, he also ran a farm. He was, <laughs> you know, uh, in, uh, about 50 miles away, so he was a real eccentric, but, uh, and I was just in Dublin, you know, there. You know, they don't have to get drunk to talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's wonderful just seeing their success uh, due to education. Yes. And, uh, you know, it's uh, nice. Uh, uh, no, I don't, you know, follow the Irish academic, I mean, the academic scene, you know, whether there's. Uh, you know, someone in the UK, you know, I just sort of thought that probably Harvard should bring someone from the UK if it wanted a, you know, someone who could speak and things like that. I mean, American <laughs> academia has got so dreary because people would never say anything. That, uh, you know, the masters of Oxford and uh, Cambridge colleges, uh, on the whole, they, they can give a good talk and they're sensible and uh, responsible. Uh, you know, the, there's a reason everyone thinks back to Robert Hutchins. He, yes. he was the last one who, who dared uh, try and ask what the hell we're in college for. And uh, how do you... Uh, but... Uh, You know, if, if I think, you know, what's the prime discipline, I, I mean, you know, the thing people should know is history. You know, just why, a real feeling for history. And uh, so I think somehow we've got to take, you know, our scientists and uh, try and at least expose them to the world of ideas that they've never seen in their life. So I'm, you know, trying to find someone who will let us build sort of a equivalent of an Oxford College, which is the uh, idea of civilizing scientists. Well, no. Dr. Watson, speaking of Oxford, there's a question from Professor Iverson from Oxford University. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, I'm now I'm now in Oxford, but I was a student in Cambridge yes. soon after you made your very famous discovery with Francis Crick. And I remember the hut in which you did that science. 
Odell. No, they wasn't. That was where Francis worked with Sidney Brenner. We were in the Austin way. We were in the 1939 in a rather brick utilitarian oh. building. Uh, <laughs> not the, 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 essentially when Neville Mont became president. Uh, professor of physics, he didn't want to give space to the biologists, and so they were forced out into the, uh, the, the temporary building which had been there uh, since the war. Uh, my thought of, uh, you know, how to, uh, uh, the way to make science uh, come alive in Cambridge is to have a branch of the waxworks there. Uh, where, you know, when it's raining and you can't, you know, walk around uh, the backs, uh, you could hear the voice of Francis Crick coming out of the box in Sydney. And, uh, you know, you'd hear Rutherford and you would try and really create what, uh, because you can go to Cambridge and have no idea it was the greatest place in the world ever for science. No other places in, you know, <laughs> the same league. So the waxworks would do it. And you could convert that whole inner center of Cambridge next to the Eagle, you know, <laughs> into, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so if I had a lot of money, you know, I would see if I could make money by having a waxwork. So, you know, you would have to include the, you know, the visit of the Queen or something. To, <laughs> you know, the Queen opening the new laboratory of molecular biology. So you could, you know, appeal to the the masses uh, in this way, uh, but. Uh, uh, you know, you, the, you could let Francis talk about uh, his, uh, uh, when he was in the Admiralty in the war. No one appreciates that he was, did something. You know, he sunk, his idea sunk uh, 100 German minesweepers. <laughs> you know, he was, but the official secrets I never knew, and no one gave Francis credit for his brain. Uh, so, and... You know, I, I've had this waxwork stream for at least 20 years as a way of uh, uh, making science, uh, you know, it wouldn't go to Harvard Yard. I mean, you know, I, you, you wouldn't have that much to say. But, you know, Cambridge, you know, really, you know, you can go with Newton. You know, you, you got a great story, the young Darwin, and uh, <laughs> The great, you know, Indian mathematician. Raman. Yes, so, not Raman. Uh, Ramanujam. Yeah, yes. So, I mean, you know, you, you could, <laughs> you know, you could <laughs> show it in a, you know, real fun way. Uh, and I think we need these tricks so that when, uh, yeah, yeah. Dr. Watson, yes. a gentleman outside has posed the question, do you think that the next great discovery in science will come from a large research institute or a small laboratory? It'll probably come from some small group of, uh, uh, it'll probably occur in a, in a great intellectual center because that's where people who gravitate to and it's hard for one person to do it by himself so it could occur in La Jolla I mean could you can say could anything occur in something as big as scripts why not <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't rule it out I mean you know uh, I don't think just being small per se would uh, but very much depends on the freedom uh, given to the younger people and what pressure they are to get grants and uh, uh, you know to be like everyone else yeah, if you have a society which really genuinely likes people who think, uh, then you will create the atmosphere. And uh, where you, you know, you have people who talk about uh, what the future may be. Yes. So, uh, uh, La Jolla has this good chance of, uh, you know, being the next center, provided uh, uh, 
provided the young people aren't there to get grants for the older people. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's a big change. <laughs> but uh, that certainly, uh, uh, you know, lends to the people being ordinary. It's a question from this gentleman, Dr. Watson. Yes. Uh, when Freeman Dyson was here recently, he, he thought that global warming was about number 17 of all the perils we face. Wh wh where would you put it? I am not uh, Freeman's intelligence to uh, feel confident in such a remark. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Perhaps one, oh, there's a question from the lady, ma'am. I would discount global warming from old people like me <laughs> and Freeman. You know, it really is not something we even think about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard to get people to worry about something which is not going to occur when you're old. And they have no faith in, you know, coming back in reincarnation or nothing. You know. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't listen to anyone... Uh, Older than 60. <laughs> you, know, you know, they, they might have to bear, you know, 25 years of this curve looking ominous. There's a question from the lady right here. Yes. Dr. Watson, I know the answer is no, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Will you be on my dissertation committee? <laughs> that would be a great honor. Yeah, no, no, I, I'm probably not qualified, and uh, uh, I'll make an exception. <laughs> Is there perhaps one last question? Oh, maybe from Sumi. Yes. yes. Hello. Uh, a cool spring. You no, know, your Francis is French. Yes. That we were in Tokyo and Japan together. Hey. Uh, a cold spring harbor, uh, what sort of trick have you implemented so that scientists won't become boring scientists? Oh, I think they're pretty boring there now. Uh, I mean, in the sense that they're not educated. Uh, uh, you know, and they're working so hard to get the next grant. That, that dominates, uh, I think, their existence too much. And uh, but if look, we a don't have a culture, you know, like you have here, where you have so many other disciplines and your community is much broader, where it's really pretty narrow. And, uh, you know, if I could stay around for 25 more years, I would. You know, certainly, you know, trying to have a group of moral philosophers at Cold Spring Harbor, I would uh, have historians who, you know, try and see science. Uh, I'd have a journalism school. Uh, and, uh, of course, you, you know, you have the people who are, you know, trying to make people know how to write the English language, which is very important because so many people come from outside the United States and don't know how and really can't succeed in the United States unless they have some mastery of English. So uh, that's got to be an important part of, you know, any scientific institution. Uh, it, Did you know, uh, do you meet Robert Hutchins and, and what is your opinion of Robert Hutchins? The question is about Robert Hutchins. He paid too much attention to philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but was very charismatic and the students really liked him. And uh, the faculty didn't. But uh, he, I think, correctly saw that some people should be paid to be great teachers which, you know, uh, just doesn't occur uh, probably even here. And I think that is a big mistake. Um, my father was at Oberlin with uh, Hutchins. So Where? At Oberlin College. Okay. My, my father was only there for a year. So when I went through and got some commencement, uh, Hutchins saw my father and me said, hello, Jim. So uh, uh, I heard many stories about Hutchins. Uh, he uh, thought people wouldn't behave. I don't think he believed in God, but he thought God was necessary to have the masses moral. 
Yeah, whereas now we're, we've changed the mind that morality comes from DNA, not from uh, <laughs> you know, being told to believe in the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments flow out of our DNA, not. Uh, not uh, and uh, so Hutchins was never exposed to that. His father was a professor of theology, I think, at Berea College in Kentucky. So he grew up as a child of a minister and, you know, was really trained to be a minister. He really could speak and uh, uh, gave extraordinary talks. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, just my desire, you know, to be a good public speaker uh, was here in So I don't think he ever bored anyone. Uh, uh, he, he peaked as president when he came out to the Santa Barbara. I'm afraid that was a total failure. He studied at democratic institutions, and uh, but uh, uh, you know that you know learning from textbooks is not necessarily the best thing. And, uh, you know, I, you know, his sidekick, Mortimer J. Adler, was uh, uh, not universally liked. Not an opportunist. Yes. And, uh, but some of the teachers at Chicago and social sciences and humanities were very good. And that's what I remember. Uh, so, you know, if I ever have a fortune, I would give some back to Chicago, probably to promote the college. You know, the fact that you should <laughs> really uh, uh, take undergraduates seriously and don't let them uh, be lazy. You know, until they, you know, that, uh, <laughs> they don't be sloppy. Well, Dr. Watson, thank you very much. Uh,